I got trouble, some heart inside my DNA I just win again, then win again Like Wimbledon I serve Yeah, that's him again The sound, the engine in is like a bird You see fireworks and Corvette tire skirt The boulevard I know how you work I know just who you are See, use it, use it, use it Your hormones probably switch inside your DNA Problem is, all that sucker shit inside your DNA Daddy probably snitch Heritage inside your DNA Backbone don't exist Burn on side they jack all right, family. Good evening. Amelia, you want to take us away? Yeah, thank you so much. So first, I'd like to say there are a lot of Amelia Wheelers in the room tonight um, because I shared my Zoom link with uh, Anthony, who just blasted it out to a few of you. So if you are incorrectly named Amelia Wheeler, you can rename yourself by clicking those three little dots in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen. And then you can click rename and name yourself uh, something appropriate, or you can just stay with my name. Um, so hi, you all, my name is Amelia Wheeler and I'm one of the co-facilitators of Teach the Truth Thursdays. And we're just really um, honored and thankful to have you all here tonight to hear our illustrious speaker, Anthony Downer. And before we get started, I wanted um, to kick it to Sierra, who is the representative here from Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, um, which is our host organization. So Sierra is gonna jump in for just a moment and let you know about the amazing work that Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement does in our community. Thank you, Amelia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sierra Thomas, and I am an intern here at Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. The mission here is to encourage fair treatment of people of all races, bring awareness to inequities, and advocate against systematic practices used to re repress or cause harm to particular groups or individuals. Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement strives to break the cycle of systematic discrimination in schools, the criminal justice system, or the business environment with the focus on racial and social issues. To fulfill this mission, Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement develops sustainable programs, provides resources, and runs workshops and trainings that foster positive social change. Teaching the truth is important by working not only to fix the problems of today, but for future generations. Our purpose is to teach the whole truth and to avoid the aspects of history that makes us uncomfortable. And I will let Amelia introduce our speaker for the night. Yeah, and let's give it up for Sierra and just like the great team here at Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement. They do a lot of powerful work here in our community. And I'm for one, just so grateful that we um, are here tonight um, in their space. Um, and so I'm also really grateful to have the illustrious Anthony Downer. Um, Anthony Downer II, he is an abolitionist educator and organizer who currently teaches civics and Africana studies at Frederick Douglass High School in Atlanta, Georgia. And Anthony uh, is also the founding member of the Gwinnett Educators for Equity of Justice, which has been a organizing group with uh, pretty uh, successful initiatives in the Gwinnett County area. And so um, I know that our Athens space as we're growing and think about mobilizing, we're really happy to have Anthony as a resource um, to learn from him. Um, Anthony Downer also holds a master's of arts and teaching from Georgia State University and a bachelor of arts in political sci uh, science from the University of Chicago. And he's previously worked in civics engagement and community centric organizations government office and political and grassroots campaigns. Um, and outside of all of this, he enjoys outside of teaching and organizing, he enjoys following shows, social media and sports. And he was raised in and resides in North Cross, Georgia. And another kind of feather in Anthony's cap is uh, he has a podcast called That Way Conversations on Education and Liberation. And I'm just gonna drop a link to that one of the episodes in the chat for you to follow up later uh, so you can keep up with him and his amazing work. So without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce Anthony, our facilitator for week four for Teach the Truth Thursdays. Let's give it up, y'all. Family, it is such a pleasure and an honor to join you tonight. Um, I got a first shout out, Amelia, Chaplain Cole, and the entire AADM family. Thank you so much. Um, and I was really, really excited to join you all physically in uh, Athens, um, uh, which is a ways away. But um, I also got a shout out 
Them dogs, wow. Now, I'm not pandering. I know some of y'all are from Athens. I am not pandering, um, even though I didn't go to UGA. Huge Georgia fan, native of Georgia. Uh, my dad is actually a bigger dogs fan than I am and got this for me for my recent birthday. Uh, just turned 27. Wow, I know that's not, I know that's a, 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 like a baby to y'all, but that's that's a milestone for me and my friends. <laughs> Let me indulge, but thank you so much for letting me be here and allowing me to have this really black centric discussion on critical race theory. And I wanna emphasize that this is gonna be a black centric discussion. We're not gonna talk so much about the attacks. We're not gonna talk so much about what governments are doing or the bans or how white folks are going crazy about critical race theory. We're gonna talk about the foundations, the histories and the connection to black uh, um, a history and voices and narratives. So really excited to get started and talk about all things critical race theory. First and foremost, I always start off with the song of the day. Music gets me movement moving. It's also the uh, centerpiece of all black culture and history. And so today I start off with our song of the day from Kendrick Lamar, my favorite rapper, uh, whose song was DNA off of his album, Damn. Um, and some of the lyrics, I can, first of all, I gotta read some of the lyrics, so I, I apologize. I can listen to the song 10,000 song times and then still get many of the lyrics wrong. Can I get an amen? So he says, I got loyalty, royalty inside my DNA. Cocaine quarter piece, got war and peace inside my DNA. I got power, poison, pain, and joy inside of my DNA. I got hustle through ambition, flow inside my DNA. And, and that really is relatable because it, he's talking about the struggle and the joy, the highs and lows of black culture and history, the epitome of what it means to be a black man in America. Uh, and so I, so big ups to Kendrick Lamar and his music, which has gotten me through many, many, many a days, many, many a nights, whether it's writing a BA thesis in college or trying to lesson plan now as a teacher, uh, really appreciate it, Kendrick. And if y'all can give me some tickets, that's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking, okay? <laughs> I wanna start off before our conversation on my personal story and my narrative connected to black history. Uh, here you see Vidalia Westbrooks and JB Westbrooks, my great grandparents, my grandmother's grandparents. Uh, in the 1930s, about 1939, they migrated from Fairview and other neighboring parts of Texas to Oakland, California, during what we know as the Great Migration. We know that during the, uh, from 1910, about right around World War I, to about 1970, Black folks fled the South, fled the racial terrorism, the lack of economic opportunity uh, to travel to Northern and Western cities. And my great grandparents were a part of that movement. They settled in Oakland and they became, uh, many of them became longshoremen. They joined unions, they organized. In fact, in the 1980s and 90s, they boycotted um, docks from, or ships from South Africa um, in order to boycott and protest apartheid. They organized with the Black Panther Party. They, uh, my, my great aunt was the first black woman um, a truck driver in the city of Oakland. My grandmother um, was a recording secretary and president of the National Council of Negro Women. They became activists. They became agitators. They became disruptors. And I say this because uh, I'm at Frederick Douglass High School. This is my first year teaching there, my fourth year teaching uh, in general. And I say this because I had a one of my um, um, leaders, my department chair actually, came to me and she said, Anthony, could you be less militant? Could you not be so militant? Uh, and I, I'm assuming she was talking about some of the conversations we were having in our uh, professional learning communities and around curriculum and discipline. And I should have responded that I know nothing else but militancy. It literally runs in my blood. I know nothing else but to be Anthony the agitator, downer the disruptor. And so I have to shout out the Westbrooks, the Adams family, the Crockett's, who are a part of Black history. And that brings me to my narrative. <laughs> Here you can see me pictured. I don't know how old I was. I had to be 
a little boy. You can see my brother in the background, um, uh, the second under me. I'm the oldest of four boys. Uh, born to a mother of Oakland, a father who grew up in around the Ben Hill, Pittsburgh area of Atlanta. Um, and as you can see with the microphone, ever since I could talk, I haven't stopped. <laughs> and, and so uh, where I am now, I'm a, I teach Africana studies and civics at the Frederick Douglass High School on the, on the uh, west side of Atlanta. I grew up in Norcross, Lilburn, graduated from Burkmar High School in Gwinnett County Public Schools taught in Gwinnett County Public Schools for three years. Um, I was let go uh, um, just this past year. My contract was not renewed. And that's because we built a massive movement in this county uh, to push for racial equity and justice. Um, and and I'm, I'm so proud, I'm so thankful to all the students, all the parents, all the community members that have inspired this work, that have uh, joined the work. And I, I'm so excited to share um, some of that work that has inspired ours. Uh, but here you can see an example of someone who's been doing this work since I was in diapers, right? And, and I'm on fire about this conversation because we have some clarity. We have an opportunity for uh, clarification. How many of you, and be very honest with yourselves, you don't even have to say in the chat, how many of you, when the attacks on critical race theory started, you yourself had to go to Google to figure out what the heck they were talking about. Wait, I'm progressive. I'm on the left, but I don't really know what critical race theory means. And they're saying we're teaching in the classrooms. I don't think so. Many folks on our side had to Google it, which is a good thing because now more of us are ready to learn more about it and to teach it, right? Thank you, Becca. <laughs> Shout out to Becca. Uh, and, and all the other union organizers uh, that are here tonight. So let's start with a, an icebreaker. I do this with my students. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of our presentation, let's start with some what we call social emotional learning uh, and some relationship building. This is a game I love called this or that. It's gonna get a little contentious. So get ready to get controversial. And as you can tell tonight, it's gonna to be a real conversation an authentic conversation, in some ways an uncomfortable conversation. Uh, and, and this game will prepare us for it. So drop in the chat box your choice after I present the two options, this or that. Let's get started. Coffee or tea? We'll start very basic. Coffee or tea? Ooh, lots of coffee, both, okay. Coffee, coffee, okay. Oh, all right, no Brits, no no tea? Okay, we don't have any British folks here today? Okay, okay, that's okay, that's okay. All right, next one, so coffee takes that one. Dogs or cats? Dogs, there we go, there we go. There we go, that's what I'm talking about, dogs. Pit bull, I, I'm sorry, I have to shout out my favorite breed, the pit bull. Cats, okay. And cat folks, please refrain from trying to explain to us why cats are the best, please. Oh, they're not that mean. Oh, well, please don't, don't rationalize it. We don't need it. Not tonight. All right, dogs, take that one. Next, are you a morning person or a night person? And I put this person jogging because I assume that's what more than people do. I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm still trying to find my glasses and figure out the day. When I wake up, I assume you're getting up early for some reason, right? All right, midday, okay, night, night, night. Okay, morning, some morning, folks. All right, midday, I like that though, I like that. All right, so uh, night takes that one. Would you rather travel to the future or blast into the past? Okay, past, future, 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 blessings to the past, blessings to the past, future, future, future. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go be honest, I'm eyeing some of y'all because I'm not going back to any, the past what? <laughs> the dinosaurs? I'm not going back, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm not going back to before black people had civil rights. Uh-uh, I'm not going, uh-uh, new. <laughs> 
future, right? Yeah, you want to see what's going on? Yeah. I think the future got that one. All right, next. Football or football? Which one? Which one do you want? All right, football or soccer, or either the rest of the world calls it football. Okay, we got some football. No, okay, neither, neither. Basketball, okay. It's hit it, something else. All right, I think, I think that was kind of close. I think football, the American football took that one. All right, next. Ooh, we're getting contentious, folks. The Chick-fil-A sandwich or the Popeye sandwich? Which one? Choose ye today. <laughs> Something vegan. Okay, nothing. Okay. Neither. Vegetarian. Oh, I, I guess that should have been more inclusive. Is that discriminatory? My apologies. Didn't mean to ex exclude anyone. Okay, ooh, this is split down. Okay, Popeye's. You know, it depends. It depends. I really like the, the sauce on the uh, Popeye's. It depends, it depends. Okay, I see some Chick-fil-A, some Popeyes. I'm surprised my Chick-fil-A folks aren't going harder. Usually this, will, this is what starts the arguments. All right, next, 80s rock or 90s R&B? Okay, I don't mean to call out folks by generation. I'm not trying to get anybody to expose their age. Okay, <laughs> 80s rock or 90s R&B? There we go, 90s, 90s, 80s new wave, nice, nice, 90s, 90s, I'm 90s, baby. 1994, hit the floor, where we at? <laughs> 90s, 90s, okay, my people, my people. 90s takes the win, pineapples on pizza, or no, never, ultimate sin. Crime against, <laughs> crime against humanity. <laughs> we got some yeses. Okay, we got some yeses. We're going to make them feel welcome. You have a space here. If for some reason you eat pineapple on your pizza, welcome. Okay, we love you still. We will find you some help. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, depends. 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 All right, last one. Okay, another contentious one, y'all. West Coast versus East Coast. Big year two pop. Big year two. Choose you today. You got you to side. Okay. And this is before the South started taking over. Okay. This is before the South takes over. Tupac, Tupac. Okay. It was all a dream. Okay. She, okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> Tupac, not sure. Okay. Tupac, come on. Tupac, all the way. Come on. Hail Mary. Oh, wow. See, I knew this was one of my people. That's, see, I, the only reason I did this was to find out if I was amongst my people or not. I had to find out, are these my people or not? These are my people. All right, last one. Should we be whitewashing history or teaching the truth? Whitewashing history or teaching the truth? My people, my people, that's what I'm talking about. Well, welcome to another Teach Truth Thursday. I'm really excited to be here. We are going to be teaching the truth tonight. So excited for you all to join us. Tonight's norms, I got to start this off. These are norms that I have on my show, in my classroom, in my conversations with my other activists. These three pillars of conversation, of discussion, of learning and growth, of education, these three uh, pillars, if you will, really bring together all the work we have around teaching the truth. Tonight, we will commit to criticality. We are anti-racist and anti-oppression in all forms. Our conversations critique power and promote equity. Intellectualism, we will decolonize the learning space in preparation for activism or in action. This is a equal space. Jump in, jump out. Unmute yourself if you need to. Say amen. And in fact, usually I would have everyone unmuted because I want to hear your mm's and your ah's. 
I want to hear the things that happen naturally with human beings. And then we will commit to joy. We will celebrate ourselves and our backgrounds, cultures, identities, and collective humanity. That is why we're here. We're here not to be stressed out, not to talk about how weary we are, but to sharpen each other and to be joyful in that endeavor. And so I thank you so much, so much. You could be anywhere doing anything and you chose to be here instead. To that end, before we get to what critical race theory is, I wanna share a narrative, a story. On October 28th, 1958, a mob of white men in Monroe, North Carolina, threatened to lynch a nine-year-old black boy named James Thompson after a white girl kissed him on the cheek. He and his friend, David Simpson, were rescued, if you will, from that mob, but later arrested and jailed for three months. Let me tell you the full story. Earlier in the day, a group of children, including James and David, were playing together outside when they started a kissing game, during which a white girl their age named Sissy kissed James on the cheek. After the girl mentioned the kiss to her parents, her father grabbed a shotgun and arranged a mob to go to the Thompsons' home, where they threatened to lynch James, David, and their mothers. The boys were not home when the mob arrived, but the police found them shortly thereafter and jumped out with their guns drawn before taking them into custody, where they were beaten by the police. Again, James is nine, David is seven. James and David, unaware of why they were in custody, remained in jail for six days without being allowed to speak to their parents or any attorneys. On October 31st, a group of police officers broke into the boy's cell wearing white sheets to intimidate them while white residents of Monroe burned a cross on the Thompson's lawn and fired shots into their home throughout the boy's detention. Both Evelyn Thompson and Jenny Simpson, the mothers of the two boys, were fired from their jobs. After a brief hearing on November 4th, in which they were denied the right to an attorney. James and David were charged with molestation and sentenced to indefinite terms at the State Reformatory in Hoffman, North Carolina, because they were kissed on cheek by a white girl. When I was in the, when I was in the first grade, on the playground in our sandbox, I married my girlfriend at the time, Sarah Schooler. She was a white girl. And to formalize our kiddish union, we kissed. And in 1958, there would be an attempt on my life and an arrest, like David and James. If we don't apply a lens of critical race theory to the story, if we don't apply and critique what happened. We're not doing due diligence to what happened to James and David. Nine years old and seven years old. Nine years old and seven years old. Fast forward a few decades. On October 14th, 1982, Ronald Reagan declared drugs a threat to national security and doubled down on the Nixon administration's war on drugs and calls for new laws to impose prison sentences for drug use. Without a lens of critical race theory, to some folks this makes sense. Drug users, drug sellers, are rampant in the communities, are causing things like addiction, death, and should be punished uh, for their crimes, their crimes against humanity, their threat to national security. But when we apply our critical race lens, we realize that the war on drugs has disproportionately affected one segment of our national community. Black and white teenage boys, for instance, and adults, do drugs, smoke weed, all that at about the same rate. 
yet Black boys are four to five times more likely to be arrested and incarcerated. Drug offenses today are the number one cause of arrest. The Coke epidemic was called a national security threat. Today, the opioid crisis is called a mental health crisis. Those users of Coke were called threats. They were called criminals. They were called addicts. Today, those suffering during the opioid crisis are called victims. Black people are 24% of those arrested, yet only 13% of the US population. Nearly 80% of people in federal prison and almost 60% of people in state prison for drug offenses are Black or Latinx. Research shows that prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue a mandatory minimum sentence for Black people as for white people charged with the same offense. One in 13 Black people, one in 13 Black people of voting age are denied the right to vote because of laws that disenfranchise people with felony convictions. One in nine, including most of my scholars, one in nine Black children has an incarcerated parent compared to one in 28 Latinx children and one in 57 white children. Without a critical race theory, a lens of critical race theory, without looking at the impact on race and ethnicity, we would ignore those disparities, those inequities. On October 24th, 2012, the Obama Justice Department sued Meridian, Mississippi for incarcerating black and disabled children for dress code violations and talking back to teachers. Without a lens of critical race theory, that makes sense. We want our kids to be proper and professional. We want them to respect adults. We want them to be disciplined. So why is this targeting black and disabled children when black and, black and white children exhibit the same behaviors in schools. Without a lens of critical race theory, we ignore effects like this. And this. And this. And this. Shout out for, to Ms. Tillman and Gwinnett Stop for their work against the school to prison pipeline, which I see every single day. And so that brings us to our topic at hand. That brings us to the topic at hand. Thank you, Ms. Tillman. Okay, thank you. Ooh, Ms. Tillman, I'm so excited to see Ms. Tillman. Critical race theory. In the 1980s, in a post-civil uh, uh, rights movement world, Black legal scholars wanted to apply a racial lens to how laws were written and applied. Today, we think of the civil rights movement as a massive success, even though its two biggest products are continuously under attack. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is today almost null and void, and so legal scholars came together, black legal scholars, and they looked at the civil rights movement and they looked at how it excluded women and poor black people and queer black people. And they looked at how little it truly transformed the legal system. 
scholars like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw created what we know as critical race theory, which at first was an examination of legal issues, but today has grown into social, cultural, social, economic, et cetera, a lens at which you look at how race and racism impact systems. Today, we have subfields that look at how that might apply to the indigenous community, the Latinx community, the queer community, the poor community, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And there are a few tenets, and let me be very clear before I jump into these tenets. In schools, we do not teach critical race theory. How many times do we got to say that, Arian? <laughs> How many times do we have to say We teach a list of standards. None of our courses have critical race theory. However, a culturally relevant or abolitionist educator embed the tenets that I'm about to discuss into their classroom. I taught for uh, three years world history and these tenets in order to be a good authentic historian must be presented to the students. Tunit numero uno is a, recogn a recognition that race is made up. Race is not real. There is no biological evidence that separates us into race. We made it up for social purposes, right? And that for, uh, it's the only way world history makes sense. Yes, absolutely. I'm gonna go put my chat box over here. For power and control, divide and conquer, right? The Spanish, the Portuguese and other Europeans, we know, invaded and colonized these Americas and built a stringent and ongoing racial hierarchy in order to control. And that hierarchy is still time-tested. It's still ongoing. Tenet number two, racism is at the foundation, at the crux of every single system in this world and very much in this country. And this frustrates a lot of people. I, I remember having a conversation with a student a little while ago. And he said, Mr. Downer, you know, we're at a black school. I teach Africana studies. He says, I love what we're teaching. But I believe that many of you all are teaching us to hate white people. And I said, no, no, no. Hate is not a part of anything that we're teaching. But I got to teach the truth. And of course, and as one, is, one student remarked, we're not teaching you to hate white people. But the truth sometimes makes you hate white people. It makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you uh, uh, angry. I'm teaching my students to hate whiteness and white supremacy, to hate the system that has been uh, constructed, that gives privileges to many white people that they didn't earn, or oppression to many black people that they didn't earn. Racism is at the foundation of everything we do. In 1789, I'm sorry, the 1787, let me get my uh, uh, years right because I know I have history teachers in the room. In 1787, after the failure of the Articles of Confederation, 55 delegates from 12 of the 13 US states met in Philadelphia to author the US Constitution. They embedded white supremacy in that very document, which is still there. And in Article One, for instance, they put that every white person would be counted as a whole person and every black person or enslaved person would be counted three fifths of a person. Three fifths of a person. That is the foundation of our country. The foundation of a person. Burn it all down. All right, Aaron, hold on. Hold on. They, they do that they call to action now. <laughs> Racism is a system not so much individual anymore, the system matters and we shall talk about it. And then finally, and finally, racism is not about a few bad apples. Racism is codified in law, racism is in structures, we can find it in public policy, it is everywhere around us. It is not an oversimplification, it is not an exaggeration to say that everything in the United States is racist. Go read the 1619 Project, please. 
And so what critical race theory does is rejects this idea of colorblindness, that because we've had a black president, because we have all these black judges and black lawyers and black mayors and all this blackness that we have moved forward in such a way that race no longer matters and it should not exist and it's not a barrier to success because we are in a colorblind society. Stop it. It ain't true. And it also, and this is for my black folks, um, what I call my house Negroes. What I call my folks that like to critique black people. CRT says that the true reason, the first reason for racial inequality is racism. It's not the misbehavior or the distraction of black people. It's not rap music, as Geraldo of Rivera said, which was quoted in DNA. He said, if you don't know him, he's a Fox News uh, commentator. He said that he believes rap music is more dangerous and destructive to black men, young black men, than racism. Stop it. It ain't true. He's a tool and a fool. All right. And so critical race theory is this lens, is this way of looking at the world and to be very authentic and clear-eyed of our racism. And then finally, Tenet number four, which I argue is one of the most important tenets, that the data, the empirical data collected about Black people is not the only authentic way to look at racism and the impact of public policy and law. That lived experiences and storytelling, like the stories of James and David, like the stories of JB and Vidalia, like the stories of Anthony Downer, they too matter. That are storytelling that our narratives can also take the front seat when we talk about public policy and law. In fact, we know that in the Africana tradition, in the tradition of Sankofa, storytelling, oral storytelling, is how we communicated with each other and across generations in time. There are tribes and communities today in places like Africa and Asia that have passed down stories for centuries, not tens of years, not decades, for centuries, orally. Storytelling matters. Storytelling matters. I wanna pause here because I'm getting a lot of amens and I love it, I love it. Before we move on, do we have any questions, comments, concerns about critical race theory? And I wanna be very clear that I'm not gonna talk about the attacks today. I'm not gonna talk about the bans today. We can, you can go Google those. You can go watch the news on those. I wanna show you the black centric scholarship that took this idea, that took this grievance and the concern and blew it up into something grandiose, something that law uh, students can study, something that we can discuss today. And I wanna give a shout out to the conservative movement because if it wasn't for the conservative movement blowing this up, would we have this event tonight? Would we be talking about critical race theory today in 2021? So thank you y'all, you're doing God's work and you don't even know it. All right, let me pause here because I wanna hear, I want you to let you hear from the folks themselves. I introduce you to Dr. Derek Bell who has taught at places like NYU and Harvard and is really the father of critical race theory. In fact, in 2008, when Barack Obama was running, conservatives, you know, they were jumping on everything. They were, they were upset about everything he did. Today, Barack Obama woke up and got out the bed. We should be scared. This is the end of America, y'all. They were really upset because in the 90s, there was a picture of him hugging this man and they said, this is a radical professor who believes white supremacy is going to be the death of America. How dare Barack Obama hug him? Well, let's hear directly from Derek Bell. And I know that it might, uh, because we're on Zoom as YouTube, it might uh, be a little funky, but stick with me.
You argue that racism is an integral, permanent, and indestructible component of this society. Yeah. It's irremediable? Probably. Probably. You see, <clears throat> we live in this capitalist society, let's call it what it is, that by definition means that some people are going to make a whole lot of money gain a whole lot of power by the exploitation, if we want to use that word, of a whole lot of other people. Now, in that kind of society, how do you keep the people down below from rising up? In fact, some of the, back when capitalism was getting really started, some of the great thinkers of the time uh, felt it couldn't work. It couldn't work. Because the people down below wouldn't rise up, particularly mm -hmm. if it was in a democratic situation where they could vote. Well, it has worked. And it's worked for a lot of reasons. There is just a sense that if you work hard, you can, the Alger, uh, what is it? The Horatio Alger. Alger stories are, are, are certainly there. <clears throat> and so there are many components, but one of them is to have a group identifiable who are deemed on the bottom, even when they rise up. They're still on the bottom. Oh, there's exceptions. <clears throat> and so with that system, which we've been practicing for 300 years or more, um, even the lowliest, no account, unimpressive white man or woman uh, can feel that somehow I'm superior. And rest in peace to the late Derrick Bell. And so when we look at this, and so let's, let's get um, into the discussion quickly. What is the connection between critical race theory and the American dream? And of course you can cite, I, I listen, all of us, any of us could be in this seat teaching this. We are all experts in, in our area. So please, if you wanna bring in evidence or scholarship from your own studying and walk of life, please do so. What is the connection between CRT and the American dream? Use the chat box, unmute, whatever. Anthony, I know you're doing the teacher pauses. You're doing a great job. Um, bless it. You know, we love Derek Bell. What I need. I have to get this off my chest really fast. It's just, I, as a black educator, have realized that even my white allies have issues with really critical race theory in the sense of, it's not okay to hang a Black Lives Matter poster anymore, only. Will you put yourself in the fire when it gets real? Because we can't wake up and not be black every day. And so even through the fight, and I know Anthony, you can attest to this too, even through our grassroots movements, we have seen that at the end of the day, at the end of the road, we're standing together with people of color. And so what happens when there are sacrifices that have to be made, especially when it comes to privilege? You're privileged to be able to wake up and be white, you're privileged to be able to speak to a crowd that's not going to listen to us. Are you willing to put your privilege on the line when it gets real? My sister, wow. Whew, I, 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 I could talk for the whole hour just about Arian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Arian. And, and, We will talk in our call to action about how to use your privilege yeah. and what we need for you, from you as victims of this white supremacist system. One thing we need from you, especially if you're, if you're an educator, is stop telling your students that all they have to do is work, work hard. And that, if, if that were true, we would have a lot of black women with two, three jobs who are just as wealthy of Je as Jeff Bezos. It is not hard work that gets us to where we are. 
It is also not individualism. Are we truly surprised that there are folks who didn't want to do their part during the pandemic, even to say masked, because we've raised them to believe it is you alone that can achieve. You can be whatever you set your sights on. If you just work hard versus it's us, it's not me, it's we. In the Sankofa and Africana tradition, we must uproot individualism in favor of collectivism, right? There's a hand raised, I believe, from our other Amelia Willard. Go ahead when you're ready. I think this is me, Deirdre. Is that whose hand is raised? <laughs> Deirdre, <laughs> preach to us. Come, welcome. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you see me? <laughs> Hi, y'all. Um, I want to answer the question about like how does CRT um, um, like the circle with uh, the American dream and uh, especially in the space of one, just thank you so much for um, inviting me to the, to the, to this moment. One of the things that I want to raise is like the American dream is also about like being able to access um, funds equitably. And I want to like, like there's a broader ideological conversation around allyship and around blackness and the construct of blackness and whiteness and all of that. And I want to get into that. What I want, but but to right this second, what I what keeps me up at night is that um, in this country, in my lifetime, um, I and in you all's lifetime as well, we will probably never see the kind of influx of money that has come down through the America Rescue Plan and around um, the the funds that are coming down specifically around schools, but then also generally speaking around economic justice and um, supports for infrastructure. And that th this critical race theory conversation right now is really white supremacist culture trying to ensure that that money does not go into the hands in equitable ways or um, to black and brown and oppressed people, but also to the organizations that support them. And so if I can say, if I can use CRT as a dog whistle for diversity, equity, inclusion, social emotional learning, culturally responsive teaching, if I can take all of those words and put them, you know, kind of in this bucket around CRT, once that money starts flowing, if you have any of that in your, in the way in which you talk about the work that you're doing, it's going to um, mean that uh, school districts, county commissioners, you know, state governments can say, oh, we can't fund that body of work. And so I really think that it is, you talk, there's harm to the individual student, there's harm to teachers and teachers of color as they think about like how this all plays out. But there is such an, like this is such an insidious harm to me around like where the dollars will go over the next five years that I really want us to see us not uh, lose sight especially because you connected it to the American dream about like how, if we're fighting for CRT and if we stand up right now that we could actually have a repair strategy and reimagine schools and schooling with these dollars if we fight hard. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, wow, I appreciate that. And, and what I will say is um, the attacks are coming. And if you look at, I, I said we weren't going to talk about the bans, but when we look at the bans in places uh, like Oklahoma, they don't really mention critical race theory. They're mentioning race and culture in the classroom. They're mentioning controversial topics, right? So they are conflating all these different um, ideas under the umbrella of diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and justice and tying them to critical race theory. It's a genius topic, a, a, a tactic. It's it's almost genius, but it is so erroneous, and we have to fight a back against it. Amelia Wheeler, the real one. What's up? Yes, and again, if you are accidentally labeled Amelia Wheeler, you can rename yourself. So I'm sorry about that mishap. But um, to piggyback off of Deirdre's really um incisive comment, like you know, I think 
thinking about the American dream requires thinking about resources and money and economic distribution. And so when I originally read this bullet point, the first thing I thought about was the fallacy of standardized tests and the achievement gap, right? And so that's like a microcosm of the arguments that we hear that, you know, students can achieve the American dream if they go to school and work hard and do well on tests. You know, like that's fucking bullshit. We know it is. And um, I've seen it as a classroom teacher. And so I think one thing that critical race theory helps us say is like, no, look, wait, the standardized tests are not what's gonna close the achievement gap. This is a manufactured crisis that CRT helps us understand that this system is doing exactly what it's doing. And to speak to Deirdre's point as well, that the funds that are coming into school coffers, right, that should be serving our students equitably are going into the hands of private corporations for things like test prep, uh, canned curriculum. It's a freaking waste of teachers' times. So they're sitting in these stupid ass rooms looking at data, looking at this bullshit ass professional development that nobody wants to do. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to me because I'm a scholar of a teacher's work, uh, like teacher's labor. And so how a really powerful tool like CRT can help us really get to like the nitty gritty of questions of like economic distribution as they're tied to something like schools. And this like, you know, kind of common sense thing that people are like, oh yeah, standardized tests, meritocracy, that's good. It's like, no. So I just really appreciate you bringing this up. And I really appreciate Deidre's point to like really keep an eye on the money. Um, because I think that that's also a really helpful um, thing to like hold here. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't know we were concussed. So, okay. You can, you know, unleash the beast. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> My mom was watching, I think. So I'm going to behave. All right. So <laughs> in order to fully understand, again, this idea of impact on law and policy, we also have to bring in this concept called intersectionality, which directly ties into Kimberly uh, Crenshaw's work, especially with the Comahe River Collective. And so let's take a look about what intersectionality is. Today we hear the call for full equality for women and distinctly for women of color from a multiplicity of perspectives. Intersectionality is a term we often hear, but what does it mean? Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in 1989, explains it with a metaphor. Consider an intersection made up of many roads. The roads are the structures of race, gender, gender identity, class, sexuality, disability. And the traffic running through those roads are the practices and policies that discriminate against people. Now, if an accident happens, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. So if a black woman is harmed because she is in an intersection, her injury could result from discrimination from any or all directions. Intersectionality in all discussions of the rights of African American women today is built on the work of previous generations who have always been a part of the fight for full equality. Sojourner Truth escaped slavery in 1827 and became one of the most powerful women's rights activists of her time. She emphasized her identity as both African American and woman in her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at the Women's Convention in 1851. In 1893, Anna Julia Cooper addressed the World Congress of Representative Women saying, the white woman could at least plead for her own emancipation. The black woman, doubly enslaved, could but suffer and struggle and be silent. They demanded recognition of both the femaleness and blackness of African-American women in the struggle for political and social advancement. In 1951, the Sojourners for Truth put a call out to Negro women to convene in Washington, D.C. for a Sojourn for Truth and Justice. 132 women from 14 states responded. During the Sojourner's last Eastern Seaboard Conference, they discussed the organizational tenets of fighting against triple oppression facing working class black women of racism, sexism, and classism. Their efforts were a precursor to the black freedom activism of the black power era and the black feminist movement. Named for a raid led by Harriet Tubman, which freed more than 750 slaves, the Kumbahi River Collective was founded in 1974 by a group of self-identified queer black feminists. Their Kumbahi River Collective statement was one of the earliest explorations of the intersection of multiple oppressions to include sexuality. They stated, Our politics initially sprang from a shared belief that black women are inherently valuable. The words and actions of these leaders continue to contribute to today's discussion around intersectionality, feminism, and civil rights that demand equality and inclusion for all. Hey guys, 
is Julesy. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about African American history and culture, go on and hit that like button and subscribe. All right. Wow. First off, I want to um, highlight some of the comments in the chat box. Uh, Tiana says, CRT challenges the American dream as it pushes against the idea that, idea that people can work hard and achieve success regardless of their race. Absolutely. And um, uh, from a summon, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. You know, um, and, and Amelia, please don't apologize for cussing because uh, uh, if you don't cuss, uh, um, what you doing? What you doing? Um, <laughs> um, I, I really want to get real here. A lot of folks, when, when I was let go from Gwinnett County Public Schools, my home district, a lot of folks blamed me. They said that I unreasonably put a target on my back. I should have just sat there and ate my food. <laughs> sat there and be quiet, right? There's better ways um, to do this. In fact, one of my mentors who works in the district office, one of the associate superintendents, um, was just in a total disagreement with everything I said. Every time I spoke in front of the board, every time I uh, did an event online, he was very upset. He would text me about it. We would have fierce disagreements and it made me question his mentorship and whether we should continue that relationship. Because he believed that if you traded in your dashiki for a suit and tie, and if you worked hard and kept quiet and kept your head down, if you shaved your head, uh, um, then you too could get to the American dream. But he didn't get to where he wanted to be. And he did everything right, right? He was still passed over and oppressed and discriminated against. But he was working hard. He was wearing his suit and tie. He was keeping his head down. Your silence will not protect you. I love it, right? Okay, so here, very blinding view as we know through proven research. Where's his American dream? How does CRT, um, uh, I'm sorry, address intersectionality? And in what ways can we apply a critical intersectional lens to the world today? Either question, either question. Feel free to unmute yourself or drop in the chat box. And Amelia, we probably gonna go all the way up to seven. I, I, you know how teachers are, lesson planning, and then there's the lesson. How does CRT address intersectionality? How can we apply a critical intersectional lens to the world today? So I think we just need to really be careful when we look at CRT and intersectionality because oftentimes the generalizations that happen um, with intersectional points are misconstrued. People think that just because a black woman and a black man are both black, they face the same oppression. And we learn that that is absolutely not correct. Black women taste, tend to face almost double the oppression because they are black and because they are a woman. And so we need to be mindful of when we're looking at um, some of the injustices that we're seeing, we need to consider all, all components of someone's intersectionality. Um, I know that like, I just read an auto ethnography for school and they talked about, um, this was a, a predominantly, um, this is a black researcher who's very known, um, who works at a predominantly white institution and he still faces racism and he's middle-class. And so that has to do with his economic intersectionality factor. So just because you are middle-class doesn't mean you're not gonna face racism. So we need to consider all of the components of intersectionality. Absolutely. Thank you, Bet. That's the Bet. You know, we have to be real. And the historic freedom movements and civil rights movements, 
that have lifted up the black community have been too heteronormative and too male centric. And it's been too often that men like me um, have stood up and said, I can speak on behalf of the black community. And I believe there was a threat of that happening with groups like Gwinnett Educators for Equity and Justice, where someone like me, a light-skinned black man, stood up and, and said, hey, I think I can speak on behalf of black issues. And it took women like Debet and Arian to so graciously and inclusively say, hell no, sit down, brother. <laughs> Humble yourself, right? And when we have movements like Black Lives Matter that are Black-centric, female-centric, queer-centric, we can get closer to liberation. It's one of the frustrating things that I find in the Black community because so many Black people will go march in the streets and scream Black Lives Matter and then go beat their children at home for being queer. The same students at my school who cry racism and, and we gotta stand, we gotta protest, are disgusted at actions taken by queer folks like Lil Nas X. If Black Lives Matter, intersectionally tells us all Black lives have to matter. Disabled Black lives, immigrant and refugee Black lives, all Black lives or none at all. None at all. Powerful, y'all. Thank you so Today much. Today we hear the call. Thank you so much. And so uh, before we get into this open discussion, because I think there's a lot to be said, I just want to take a little bit to talk about how you can plug in and what this means for schools. Because although critical race theory is not taught in our schools, there is a field called critical race studies and education. And you can teach and you can advocate educationally through a lens of critical uh, uh, criticality and racism. The fight is happening in our board uh, of education rooms, at our meetings. In fact, when I look back on our movement, when I educators for equity and justice, we start all the way back in June. And one of the early decisions we said is that we're gonna start signing up to speak at board meetings. And at that time they had an option to call in. So we would just call in, I, I would be right on my bed with my speech, calling in. And then by October, I, I would say maybe August, September, the uh, white conservative parents began duplicating the effort, not just locally, but nationally to take over board meetings. We recognized that the Board of Education had a strong power in the lives and education of our children. And so in the November 2020 elections, we flipped the board from a majority uh, white and conservative or Republican board to a majority black and uh, democratic board because we knew the power. We also knew the power of the board of education to appoint the superintendent. And so our one biggest demand for these board members running and sitting on the board is that you replace the 78 year old, 25 year old serving superintendent and today Gwinnett County Public Schools has its first black, first equity centric superintendent in its history. Board of education meetings and spaces matter. They matter. And they matter. On Tuesday, many local board of educations will have elections like in Atlanta. And I challenge you to look at the record, not just the rhetoric, but the record when it comes to issues of race, of diversity and inclusion, where do these folks stand? And when the fight on critical race theory came, what did they do? Did they cower? Did they try to separate? Well, this is not what we do. Or did they defend critical race theory? Did, did they defend courses like Africana and ethnic studies? Did they cower and try to clarify? Or did they defend and stand up? Those are the candidates we need to be voting on, on Tuesday. So check your local listings, see who's running, go out and vote and support those candidates. But understand electoral politics is not the only way to liberation. 
far from it. We need to be organizing in the board meetings. And though I've retired from my position at the board meetings in Gwinnett, we need folks other than teachers to be showing up and showing out at the board meetings. Showing up and showing out at the board meetings. We realize, of course, that in order uh, to go to these board meetings, you have to feel it safe, included, heard. We know for a lot of people of color, women and other uh, groups that sometimes we're asking them to put themselves in harm's way just simply by going to board meetings. It's gotten that bad, folks. And so we thank those who organize around this and we ask that you continue to work. But these are also simple things you can do. If you're a parent, hell, if you live somewhere, chances are you live near a school. We all pay taxes that go into schools. In fact, if you live anywhere in Georgia, yes, your taxes go to Gwinnett County Public Schools as the largest school district in the state. And so it can be a simple email, a simple phone call. Reach out to your local school teacher, to the principal, to your board members, to your superintendents, and ask very simply some key questions. Like how are you teaching everyone's history and reflecting all cultures? How are you preparing your teachers to be anti-racist? Can your white teachers, if you're in a county like Gwinnett where 80% of them, 80 plus percent of them are white, how are you preparing your teachers to teach my black baby or scholar? How are you embedding social emotional learning? Because uh, we're not post pandemic, we're right in the smack dab of it. Folks are still losing folks to COVID. Folks are still losing their homes, their belongings. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So how are we taking care of each other and ourselves? Talk about curriculum and discipline, discipline, testing, community engagement, all the different facets of the educational system. As a taxpayer, you have the right to do that. As a taxpayer, you have the right to ask where your taxes are being spent, how they're furthering equity and justice. And to Arian's earlier point, hold on, that we got the, ooh, I need our, okay, this is, this is what I'm talking about. To Ms. Tillman's point here, to Arian's point, I gotta make this specific to our white folks. I gotta make this specific to our white folks. Ms. Tillman says, our white allies need to speak up in private and personal spaces to push back on white supremacy. And this is a balancing act. You have to do this in a way that does not dominate or push out black voices. We have some great white folks I wanna recognize that contributed to Gwinnett Educators and Equity and Justice. But today, as some of the founding members have taken a step back for our own mental health, for our own personal endeavors, now the movement is at risk of being too white centric. Now you have white organizers speaking on behalf of the whole community. We have to remember in counties like Gwinnett, 80% of our students are students of color, which means white voices cannot dominate cannot be prioritized. They can't be at the forefront of these movements. Those who are most affected have to be given the leadership and the voices, the reins of movements like this. I challenge our white folks to also do the work of not only interrogating and stripping yourselves of your biases, but challenging those around you to do it. I remember when I came home from college, I began to have a series of critical and crucial conversations with my parents around poverty, around homophobia, around classism, around the dominance of uh, Christianity and religion. These were hard because my parents, I love my parents. I respect my parents and I put them on a pedestal as a lot of children do. And to have to go home and deconstruct those basic fundamental beliefs that my parents had, it was hard. And yet I did it. And yet we have a great converse, uh, relationship today. You have to do the hard work of challenging and gathering your cousins. That means that sometimes Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner is going to be very, very uncomfortable. Okay. I hope you don't argue on an empty stomach. 
That means that sometimes instead of not talking to someone or cutting them off, you send them that long Facebook message or you pick up the phone and have that tough, loud, even profane conversation. We need you to gather your cousins. We need you to do the work so it doesn't fall on our shoulders. Teaching at a school like Peachtree Ridge was very hard because I taught a lot of white folks for free. And after the lynching of a George Floyd, although groups like GEJ took advantage of this white guilt, it was overwhelming. I remember going back to the classroom during pre-planning in August of 2020 or July of 2020. And I had a few, a few, more than a few of my colleagues come to my room and say things like, Anthony, I think that I'm racist. Hmm, do tell. Or Anthony, what resources, what books can I be reading? What podcasts, y'all know y'all like podcasts. What podcasts can I be listening to? Anthony, can you, Anthony, can you send me this? Anthony, can you do this? It was falling on my shoulders when Google is free. It was falling on my shoulders when NPR and the New York Times were blown up with so many different perspectives and voices and resources on this here topic. Please don't put more on, of a burden on our shoulders. You gotta take up the mantle yourselves. And once again, to my family in Gwinnett, as we build this next chapter, we need white folks to take a back seat and support us wholeheartedly. Support us wholeheartedly. I wanna pause here. I wanna pause here and allow for any comments, allow for you to digest, allow for you to question and critique. Share your, share your resources, share your experiences. This is a safe space. Okay, Anthony, I wanna share a little bit behind what GEEJ did recently go through with some of our white allies. I think that I'm coming to the space a bit upset um, in the sense of really thinking that a lot of our allies were on our side, but as soon as it really got rough, especially when you got fired, we didn't have any help at all. And so we would stare at maybe three to four of us and be like, where are all 2000 of you guys that said you really supported this movement because it shouldn't fall on the backs of just a couple, especially when we were in such numbers and so eager in the beginning. So on behalf of Jeech, I do apologize to you. You did not deserve to lose your job. And as a fellow Guanitian that has been there since second grade, I can only imagine how upsetting it is for a county that you love so much to turn their back on you when you are just trying to make it a better place for generations to follow. I remember having conversations with you for hours outside of Georgia State when we were in grad school talking about really making this county better and really being excited even on a school night to stand outside with you and to talk to you about Gwinnett County and what we could do even as novices in education for our black, younger black brothers and sisters coming through the county because we remember a time where all the black people in the county knew each other because it wasn't that many of us. I knew Everton Blair and at least knew of him and was his Facebook friend in high school. This is how small the black population of students really was because we all knew each other. And just to see later on down the line that the same primitive Eurocentric policies and procedures are guiding this school district, which is one of the largest school districts in the country, is baffling and appalling to me. And I cannot even believe it. When I came back to teach here, I wanted to teach everywhere else except for Gwinnett County because I knew what I went through as a student. 
I knew the teachers that let me fall to the wayside. You know, I almost, and just to be very frank and clear with you guys, I almost failed second grade, third grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade, but graduated Brookwood with a 3.5 as an AP scholar. Something is not right with the teachers. And if we don't get back to really looking at these teachers and holding these teachers and these admin responsible and accountable, our children will continue to fall through the cracks and it's nothing that we can do about it. We have to get back in the classroom and we have to make sure that these teachers are able to teach black and brown kids. Because unfortunately, it is not the case. We're continuing to dance around the issue. People know when these educators, and I'm just going to be honest, are racist, yet we continue still to still perpetuate the cycle. I'm tired. So Gwinnett County needs to be held accountable for their action because it's not right it's not okay to just put five black people at the district office for the picture we're diverse no we're not diverse because we know that these are just actors in a very very big pond and they're strategically placed here to subdue really the community but i really feel like the community has well has awakened and we're understanding. I'm teaching my kids every day what's going on in this county because they deserve to know. They need to know what's going on with their leaders. Nothing is off the table. It is now time for the teachers to step back and let the students and parents take the lead. And it is time. And I just want you to know that you're not alone, that Debet and I have felt miserable really without you being in this county these past couple months, it doesn't feel like home anymore because we are home to each other. If it's not for us, it's not a place. You know what I mean? And so I'm sorry, you deserve better. And I stand with you and support you in whatever you decide to do. It, it, it brings me so much hope and joy that I have had the opportunity to build such strong relationships from this movement. That yes, and we knew this, we talked about this very early on, that when you're freedom fighting and you hit the system, it's gonna hit back. If the system does anything, oh, it's gonna defend itself. And that doesn't make the, the pain any lesser, but um, there's a bigger plan in place because uh, our people, if anything, are resilient. They're subversive. That's our history. See, what I, could, what I would tell my mentor, who's a student of history just like I am, House Negroes don't change history. Moderates don't change history. It's those of us who are radical, who are uncompromising, who are visionary, who throw in the air that North Star and move their community relentlessly towards it. We have to have that fire in us every single day. We have to be committed to this fight every single day. We have to wake up and think about being anti-racism at all times or else we're not truly authentically being anti-racist. So I just shout out to Gwinnett because I know that change is going to come. And at the end of the day, no matter how, this is the funny thing about it. These folks will go to the board meetings and shout and scream, but there's a mask mandate that's mandatory. Ethnic studies is in at least 12 high schools. Is it up to 17? I heard someone say 17. Ethnic studies is, is everywhere. Culturally relevant uh, professional development is available to teachers and will soon be mandatory. Let's speak into existence. Black studies is on its way. Equity teams and equity audits and some level of equity work is in all 19 of the districts. The things that they're shouting about are already happening. And guess what? I'll tell you something else. They were approved by Republican members of the board. 
That's what Steve Knudsen and Dr. Murphy won't tell you, that they vote for budgets that increase social emotional learning and increase uh, uh, social workers that approved an ethnic studies course and resources. That's what they won't tell y'all. The fight continues and I'm so, so, so thankful. So, so thankful that you all are here for it. Before we get into some questions and answers and everything, I do got some plugs for the last 10 minutes. You can add me on Facebook, Anthony Downer. I, just, I was at this conference last, <laughs> last weekend, this past weekend, and I was telling people to add me, but I forgot I have, I have it on lock. So you can't find me really unless you have a friend of a friend. You can't really add me. I've changed some of that. So you should be able to find me and send a request. If not, then you can uh, message me and I'll get the request for the message. Please also follow me on Instagram. And this is a priority. Get my followership up, please. Um, don't have that many followers. Please follow me at the North Star because I'm from the North Side. Got a shout out North Side. Uh, you can also join in on my show, Atlanta's That Way, Conversations on Education and Liberation, every other Tuesday at 6 p.m. on Facebook Live. Our next episode is right after the election on uh, November 9th. We'll be talking to some stakeholders or rights holders, rather, uh, about what happened in elections and what we should expect next. I'm always looking for uh, um, guests to have very Black-centric conversations on Black issues and uh, to respond to critical race theory. So please join in or reach out. We also have this brand new coalition in the state of Georgia that is responding to the board of edge of the state board of education resolution. Any rule or legislation that be, might be coming up, it's called K16. That's kindergarten through grade 16. Teach Truth campaign. We're doing a lot of work to make sure there's instructional and curriculum support for teaching authentic history, but that's across all course areas, all subject areas. We have an organizing meeting this coming Sunday, Halloween edition at 11 a.m. I will decide what mask I'm gonna wear, but it's also Sunday. So uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be celebrating Halloween anyway. <laughs> we're also gonna do a picnic that's in person and we're gonna take all the precautions. It's at Honeysuckle Park in Doraville, Georgia. It'll be Saturday, uh, November 6th from 2 to 4 p.m. If you are a Black educator or Black student, please reach out because we have some awesome work that we uh, need to connect you to. There's some groups uh, to join. There's some um, uh, surveys to fill out. There's some ways to take care of you and prioritize your health and wellness. So please, please, please connect us. If you got some um, ways that you want to connect, if you got some social media or some activity, please drop it in the chat box. For our last eight minutes, let's open it up, have a discussion. I understand that everyone came here in a different space. In fact, when I got off of work, I was like, oh, man, I'm tired. It's been a tough day. Frederick Douglass High School is off the chain. The scholars are great. I love them with my whole heart. And sometimes they take my whole heart for that day. And I didn't really know how I was gonna have the energy to log in and to give you the joy, the criticality and the intellectualism that you tuned in for. But still, I showed up and you showed up and we got the job done. So I know you're coming from a lot of different spaces, mentally and emotionally. And I thank you for being here. Tell me your questions, drop your experiences. Let's have a discussion. What's happening? Anthony, I just want to um, first just say thank you for this word. I really needed it today. Um, and also for all the Black educators in this space, I am just so grateful for what you shared and your work. I am a new faculty member at the University of Georgia. Um, some struggles that I've had, though, I'm in social studies education, is even coming into their teacher ed program. I think it was my first class that I taught and we have a bachelor's and master's program and there's not one black student in two cohorts and you know interviewing for this job and applying I'm like oh I'm coming to Georgia you know Atlanta's right there thinking that I'm going to see educators that look like myself and what you just shared just reminded me of the need for more people like us but also the challenges that we face in the field and so um I just am thinking a lot and being new to this context and community, I am encouraged by the work that you all have done, but also know that it isn't without its challenges. And even myself being a person who uses critical race theory in my work, I've had to also think about what does that mean for me as a 
junior faculty member. I'm thinking about my course in particular that will be about critical race theory and how to maneuver in this climate has been interesting. Um, you know, thinking about the things that you've shared, intersectionality being that I'm not tenured, that I'm now in a state that has even said tenure will not protect you as a, a person in the a Georgia um, university system. And so just wanted to share, um, just saying thank you, but also that this work is one that I know can sometimes be thankless, but just wanted to say thank you all and I appreciate it. And I just got so much from this today and I will definitely connect with you. Um, I have a podcast too, I'm gonna not share it here, but um, I love to connect with you and to continue this conversation. So thank you. Absolutely, please, yes, drop that info and I, um, I'm gonna add you and, and, and we'll connect. Um, folks, this is historic and generational work as well. And so when we talk about black educators, we are following the footsteps of those who, who committed to fugitive pedagogy, right? That built underground railroads, quote unquote, to teach their students the truth, dating all the way back to the time of, of W.E.B. Du Bois, dating all the way back to Frederick Douglass on slave plantations. Uh, we've been doing this work for generations. And so any support you have for black educators, support your local black educator, Black Teachers Matter. So I'm going to jump in here. I want to thank you as well, Anthony. Um, this has been really, really good. You know, I was listening to your last episode of um, <laughs> That Way, and I don't know if you got to see all the comments because I was like, preach, tell the truth, tell the truth. Um, <laughs> I just couldn't help myself, even though it was after the fact, I had to do all my comments as I was listening, right? Today, I spent a full day in the GEMS committee with GCPS. So this was really needed. Um, it is just so interesting to see with all that's going on and the change in our student body that um, the educators who worked on the AKS still did not see the need to take out some of that Eurocentric focus. They can't see it. They just, they just can't even see it. Um, and we won't even discuss the fact that I, I, I selected a, one group and they put me in another, right? But it didn't matter because see, I can bring my culture and my blackness to wherever I sit my black ass, okay? So let's keep that clear. Um, so there I was in fine arts, turning it out. And there I was <laughs> language arts, which is a place that you know that you'd expect to turn out and I got to do that as well. Um, it is just so important that we bring our full selves um, to what we do. And we're not trying to, well, I personally, and I don't think most black folks are trying to erase anybody. We're trying to add the stew and give the flavor that's already there that just keeps being left out. Um, and so some of that flavor I hope shows up. I will check back with them to see where they are. Thank you for this. Thank you, thank you so much. We stand on shoulders like those of Miss Tillman. GEJ was not that innovative and unique. We were on the shoulders of freedom fighters like Ms. Tillman, who was doing the work way before us, right? And we just kind of added our little millennial flair. I also want to um, drop some of the sources. My students always say, well, teachers are always saying, you know, don't plagiarize, but where y'all get y'all lessons from? What's teachers pay teachers? <laughs> so I got it. I got to give a shout out to the many uh, sources here, which I, if you don't know some of these sources, if you don't know some of these scholars, please check them out. They have lessons, they have more videos, they have so much more information to learn, not just about critical race theory, but so many other topics um, on how we push this move, movement for abolitionism, equity, and justice forward. Y'all, I'm full. My heart and my spirit has been filled up. And I thank you so, so, so much for the opportunity. Thank you to AADM, shout out to Chaplain Cole, shout out to Amelia, shout out to the Athens community, go dogs! And thank you so much for the opportunity. Let's continue this conversation on that way and the many other spaces that we have. 
get home safe. I know y'all are already at home. And thank you. Peace, love, and joy. Let's give it up for Anthony one more time, y'all. Yeah. Um, tune in next week. Anthony, uh, we'll you rock. Our Teach the Truth uh, about how to teach about reparations within the classroom and outside the classroom. So we hope to see you then. And you can also catch all our recorded sessions of former Teach the Truth sessions on the AADM website. So thank you so much, Anthony, for your amazing work and leadership and for everyone who shared your really important perspectives tonight. The mall closes in one minute where the Jester Center is. So we have to hop off. <laughs> we gotta go. Bye, y'all. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you, Mr. Downer. Bye. I'm in the airport in DC. You're awesome. Thank you. Absolutely.